Well, this time children in preschool through kindergarten are dismissed for children's church. And as they're going, I invite you to turn in your Bibles once again to John the 10th chapter. And as we are turning in the word, let us also turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do ask that you would speak to us from the pages of your word this morning. Father, in these familiar words, Father, in the familiar image of Jesus as our good shepherd, Father, we would ask that you would not cause us simply to yawn at the familiar, but Father, may we be entranced by the wonder that we find in this revelation of Jesus, which he gives to us. Father, we ask that you would, according to the prayer of the psalmist, open our eyes that we would see wonderful things in your word. And Father, in seeing them, Father, may we respond to them in ways that bring glory to you and to your Son and our Savior Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. She was born in 1863, two years before the end of the Civil War. Her name was Helen Lemmel. She was a gifted musician and a songwriter and a singer. When she was 43 years old, she went to Germany and she stayed there for four years while she received further vocal training. And while she was in Germany, she met a man who became her husband. And after four years, they moved back to the United States in 1911, and she con continued to sing on the gospel music circuit. But eventually, her life's journey took her to Moody Bible Institute, and she became a vocal instructor there. Well, along the way, and as they, she was serving it at Moody, tragedy struck. She developed an illness, and that illness ultimately resulted in blindness. She lost her sight, and her husband, of just a few years, was unable to cope with the thought of having a blind wife. And so he abandoned her. This and other challenging experiences gave birth to these words that she put to paper. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see? There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. And then she offers that invitation, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Life, she sang of, having lost her husband, having lost her sight, Yet she could sing about life more abundant and free. Well, isn't that what everybody wants? A life of abundance. That's what human beings want, and that is what human, be human beings have been ingenious in their attempts to attain it. Some have sought to find abundant life through hedonism. If it feels good, do it. A mindset made very popular by a graduate of the University of Illinois, right? A gentleman named Hugh Hefner. If it feels good, do it. You have an appetite for it. You have a hunger for anything. You will find an abundant life if you just pursue it and do it. Uh, others have sought an abundance of life by seeking a, sort of a cousin to hedonism, materialism. You, you get the right things, and, and a good life is found in the accumulation of those things. And the more things, and the finer things, 
the better the life. Some have sought to find an abundant life in, in through the political arena. Socialism. Communism. Everybody sharing equally of resources. Promises an abundant life for all, but often is an abundant life for none. Then there's altruism or do-goodism that will bring an abundant life. You, you adopt a cause, you save the whales, you build a house, you, you sleep overnight in a cardboard box and help the homeless. You be a good person and do a good things, and that will lead to a rich and full life. Uh, unfortunately, those who are looking for life more abundant and free are looking for life and looking for that life and looking for that experience in life in all the wrong places. None of these are able to offer that which the heart of mankind is searching for. We know, of course, that that abundant life is found only in relationship with Jesus. And that's why Jesus left the glories of heaven and why he came, why we celebrate his birth this time of year, why he came to what has been called a fifth-rate little ball in the universe. Recall Jesus' familiar words in John chapter 10, verse 10. I came. I left heaven and came to earth. I came to this fifth-rate little ball in the vast universe. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Well, while these words appear in John chapter 10, it, it's helpful to see them in the context of John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, we find the account of a man who, unlike Helen Lummel, didn't lose his sight later in life through a tragic experience. No, the, the man we encounter in John chapter 9 gained his sight through a glorious encounter with Jesus. After Jesus had restored his sight, the, the, the Pharisees, those who fancied themselves as the religious leaders and gatekeepers of true religion, they got wind of what had happened to this guy, and they caught up with him, and they grilled him about what happened. Tell us what happened. And not satisfied with his answers, they went to his parents. Hey, you tell us what happened to your son. And not satisfied with the parents' answers, they went back to this guy a second time. And by this time, this guy who was born blind, had never seen a thing in his life until he saw Jesus. This guy who had never seen a thing in his life was a bit put off by the Pharisees who came back to him a second time. And he told them with some aggravation, I think, or frustration that we hear in his voice, I have told you already. And you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Why do you want to hear the story of how I came to see again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Do you want to be a follower of Jesus too like I am? Is that why you're asking all these questions over and over again? Well, the Pharisees' response was, it, yeah, that's right. No, it was this. They reviled him. They insulted him. They annihilated him with their words and accusations. You were born in utter sin. Yeah, try to hear what that would sound like in our common vernacular jargon of the day. You were born in utter sin. And, and the assumption of the day was you were born, a person was born blind because someone was under God's judgment. You were born blind probably because your parents had sinned. Or maybe somehow in uterine you had sinned. But blindness was not a sign of God's blessing, but a sign of God's judgment in those days. They reviled him. You were born in utter sin. And would you, a sinner, teach us? Those 
gatekeepers of the law, and they cast him out. They cast him out of the synagogue. You have no place in religious Jewish society. You talk about a roller coaster of a day. The, the joy is seen for the first time ever, and then the pain of being cast out of that very thing that life in Judaism revolved around, the synagogue. The high and the low, the good and the bad, all wrapped together in one single day. In fact, in a matter of hours. But, but the day didn't end there. For this man, it said that the text says that, that Jesus heard that they had cast him out, that the Pharisees had cast this guy out. And having found him, Jesus went looking for him. He said, do you believe in the Son of Man? The Son of Man was a commonly understood reference to the, the coming Messiah, the one who was promised in the Old Testament scriptures that would come and deliver the people and bring salvation. And Jesus said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Yeah, I, I want to believe in him. Who is it? Jesus said to him, and, and don't miss this. Don't, don't miss what this says. Jesus said to him, you have seen him. You've seen the Son of Man. You've seen the Son of the, the promised Messiah. You have seen the Savior sent from God. In fact, he was the very first thing you ever laid eyes on. When your eyes were opened for the very first time, you were looking into the face of the Son of Man, the promised Messiah. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. The formerly blind man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. This formerly blind man gave Jesus the reverence and worship that rightly belongs to God. He understood that this man was the promised Messiah. The man became that day a disciple of Jesus. And he was still... And he would continue to remain an outcast in society. A disciple of Jesus, an outcast in society. But that day, that man found the abundant life which Jesus came to give, which Jesus alone can give. All of which, lead, all of which leads us here. Jesus, God's Son, whose birth we celebrate during the Christmas season, he came to earth that those who turned to him might experience the abundant life which only Jesus can give. The man of John chapter 9 probably needed to hear what Jesus had to say about the abundant life which is a possession of those who follow Jesus because his life that day had changed so drastically as he identified himself as a disciple of Jesus. And maybe we need to be reminded of those things as well. When we are tempted to start looking for life in all the wrong places, and when things come in life where we're tempted to turn not our eyes upon Jesus, but to turn our eyes away from Jesus, and looking for peace and joy in all that life can give in different directions, in different faces, in different places. Maybe we need to be reminded when we're tempted that abundant life is found in Jesus. Here in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10, we find and we're reminded of three benefits which make for an abundant life. Abundance which Jesus alone can give to his followers, his disciples, to those who turn their eyes and keep their eyes fixed and focused upon him. Let's take a look at those this morning. First of all, the abundant life is ours. It's the possession of the follower of Jesus because we are known by him. Jesus knows his own. Our text begins this way. Truly, truly, 
And again, when we see that in especially the book of John, we are talking about truths that were of utmost significance that people would not know had Jesus not come to earth to tell us. It's like neon lights flashing. Truly, truly, you don't want to miss this, Jesus is saying. You, 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 may not, you may miss something else I have to say, but don't miss this. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. Now, now some people see a strong division between chapter 9 and chapter 10, like Jesus is leaving the blind man behind and moving on to to other subjects and other topics and greener pastures. But there's two things that speak against this, that that, that show and demonstrate that chapter 9 is tightly bound to chapter 10. The first is Jesus' truly, truly statement. Jesus never begins a new topic by saying truly, truly. He always is addressing something that's already happened. And so when he says truly, truly, we're going to look back to John chapter 9 to see what's just happened. Because what the truth he is about to reveal has a special significance to what happened before. But also you look later on in John chapter 10 verse 21, it takes us back once again to the blind man that we did encounter in chapter 9. There we read, others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? See, the the subject matter hasn't changed. They're still talking about the glory of Jesus and how it was revealed to the man in chapter 9. So there's a continuation of the subject matter between chapter 9 and chapter 10. That subject being a man who came out as a disciple of Jesus, and who is feeling the wrath of others and the pressure which comes from identifying as Jesus' disciple. He is feeling that, and he is experiencing some of the challenges of turning his eyes on Jesus and being a disciple of Jesus. So Jesus, in a nutshell, is talking to his disciples in general, but more specifically, he continues to talk to his newest disciple. And his counsel is simply this. There are those who present themselves to be shepherds of God's people. But these people who present themselves, and he's talking to the blind man, he's talking about the Pharisees who had just got done reviling him and insulting him and trashing him. He said, young young man, there are those who present themselves to be shepherds of God's people, but who care nothing about the sheep but only care about themselves. People like the Pharisees. Then there's the true shepherd. Jesus. And then Jesus gets around to identifying himself as such in verse 11 as he says, I am the good shepherd. And Jesus tells his disciples, and he tells this man who was cast aside and reviled by the religious leaders, The the sheep hear his voice, and he, the good shepherd, calls his own sheep by name. The formerly blind man heard Jesus' voice and recognized him as being from God, and he followed him. Unlike the Pharisees, he refused to see the hand of God in what Jesus did and refused to hear the voice of God in what Jesus said. So the blind man responded to Jesus, and Jesus, for his part, he knew his name. To know someone's name suggests an intimate relationship between two people. Jesus knows his disciples. He knows their name. By that, he knows his character. He knows what makes them tick. He knows what challenges they face. He knows what their needs are. There was a song that came to mind as I was reflecting upon the fact that Jesus knows our name, that he cares for us. It's an old song that we used to sing in church a long time ago. We probably don't sing it anymore, and maybe we don't sing it enough. It was a simple chorus from Maranatha Music uh, some years ago, years ago. And the song went like this. I have a maker. He forms my heart. Before even time began, my life was in his hands. I have a father. 
He calls me his own. He never leaves me, no matter where I go. And then the chorus. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. You see, those who turn their eyes upon Jesus, we have a maker. We have a father. We have a shepherd who knows our name. And he knew the name and the needs of that Jewish outcast who had the courage to follow Jesus. And Jesus knows the name of his followers here in Dewey, Illinois. Whether during this season you're riding the crest of a wave or feeling overwhelmed by what is currently experiencing in life, be assured that no matter what, your Savior knows you. He knows your name. He cares for you. He'll never leave you no matter where you go. I don't know how the story of the blind man turned out. But I suspect that though he was reviled and rejected by many, Jesus continued to meet his needs. And that is the benefit, that is the blessing which accrues to every follower of Jesus. He has a personal relationship with you and an undying commitment to you. He knows your name, your needs. He will always act in accord with his love for you. And there is no scarcity of life, but only abundance in following Jesus. May we never forget that. No scarcity in be a follower of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So the abundant life is ours because we are known by Jesus. But likewise, the abundant life is ours because as followers of Jesus, we are led by Jesus. He continues to address his newest disciple, this formerly blind man. The sheep hear his voice, and he, the good shepherd, calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He leads them. There is nothing more tragic than for a flock of sheep to be shepherdless. As Moses' life was coming to a close in the Old Testament, there was a weight that was really crushing him. A burden that he was carrying. And it wasn't, believe it or not, the burden of not being able to go into the promised land because of his sin. He wanted to go, but, but that wasn't what was weighing most and heaviest and deepest on his mind. Moses had led the people of Israel. He had shepherded the people for 40 years, and he knew that he was done. That he was time to die. And his heart was so burdened. He cried out to the Lord. And he said, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation, over this flock, who shall go out before them and come in before them as I have. Don't abandon this people. Who shall lead them out and bring them in that the congregation of the Lord may not be as sheep that have no shepherd. Moses could not think of anything worse than having a group of people without someone to lead them. That was the burden of his heart. Not as much as he wanted to go into the promised land. What was weighing upon him was the welfare of the flock the congregation. Well, God did in the very next verse, the very thing that Moses requested. He appointed a shepherd to carry on in Moses' absence, a shepherd by the name of Joshua. Joshua, whose name in the Greek language is Jesus. You see, Joshua slash Jesus of the Old Testament led the children of God into the promised land. The Jesus or the Joshua slash Jesus of the New Testament, the good shepherd, leads the flock of God to the abundant life. 
God did exactly what Moses requested. He gave a Joshua to Moses. He has given a Joshua, a Jesus to all mankind to lead the sheep. Jesus leads the way. He is in the front of the sheep and his sheep willingly, they gladly follow him. From his position at the head of the flock, Jesus can make certain that his sheep are on the right path to the right place. And at his place at the head of the flock, he is there to ward off any danger that may be intent on doing injury to the flock. As Jesus leads his flock to where he wants them to be, he has at the ready his rod and his staff, all the resources in his arsenal to protect the sheep. How unlike the hired hand in verse 12, who takes off at the very first sign of danger, Jesus leads his flock. And while Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of Moses' desire for a shepherd to lead God's people, Jesus is also the ultimate fulfillment. Recall we saw last week that, Jesus, that the whole scriptures are fulfilled in Jesus. And so too, the picture of David's good shepherd. David said, The Lord is my shepherd. Did you ever know you can take out the word Lord there and put in Jesus and it works just as well? Jesus is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He doesn't lead us to meagerness or scarcity. Jesus is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Jesus leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death or the the valley of deepest darkness, I will fear no evil because Jesus is with me, his rod and his staff, all the resources at his disposal. They comfort me. Still waters, God-glorifying ways, dark valleys, I suspect that the formerly blind man of John chapter 9 experienced all of those in the coming days as he walked with Jesus. And I suspect that each of us have experienced those very things on our journey with Jesus. And I trust as well that every follower of Jesus here today could likewise bear testimony to the guiding hand of Jesus, which has led you and is leading you and will continue to do so until someday down the road, you, like the blind man, see Jesus and look into his face and will confess to the glory of God and to the praise of Christ Jesus that he has led me all the way. That place prepared in glory. Jesus told his reviled and his rejected disciple, and he tells us, I will lead you to the place I want you to be, and I will protect you every step of the journey. And in his leading, there is no scarcity, but there is abundance. Because he is the good shepherd who leads us. And finally this morning, the abundant life is ours because we are saved through Jesus. We pick up the text in verse 6. John notes, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. He didn't get what Jesus was talking about, or the people didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. Jesus had just finished shining a a less than positive light on the Pharisees. He just referred to the Pharisees as thieves and robbers who, though fancying themselves to be shepherds of the flock, are in fact most definitely not. They they didn't quite get that. So so Jesus tries again. He he says, truly, truly, now get this, don't miss this. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. Again, listen to him telling this to the blind man. I'm the door for the sheep. Everyone else, those who have been reviling you, those who have been insulting you, those who have been trashing you, those who cast you out and declared you persona non grata in the kingdom of God. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me, like the Pharisees who have just cast you out, are thieves and robbers. But the sheep do not listen to them. 
I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Since they didn't grasp the imagery of him being the good shepherd, Jesus shifts image to that of a door. Jesus being the door. Inside the fold, sheep are safe. Outside of the fold, there is death and danger for the sheep. Outside is death, inside is salvation. Now, the Pharisees understood themselves and their teachings to be the way into the fold, the way into safety, the way to salvation. They believed that their ways and their teachings would get them to where they wanted to be. And the Pharisees were saying, do what we say, and you will find access into the fold and be saved. And their way, of course, that we saw last week, you keep the law of Moses as meticulously as we do, and you'll be good with God. That's all there is to it. Unfortunately, their efforts at keeping the law are insufficient themselves to gain access into the very fold of salvation. Recall what we saw last week, Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, which we encountered. For I tell you, unless your righteousness, your good deeds, exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, they can't show you the way into the fold because they can't get there themselves. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds, is superior to that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven, no matter what they're telling you. They are not the door to the sheep. The door is not keeping perfectly the law of Moses because you can't do it, and they can't do it. They're telling you that they're doing it, and that you need to do it too. Don't listen to them. To gain entrance into the kingdom, to gain salvation You've got to be better at Pharisee than the Pharisees. They are definitely not the door of salvation. So if not them, who? There's only one door through which people must pass in order to be saved, and it's not the door of the Pharisees. It's not them. It's Jesus. Jesus said, I am the door. Literally, the text says, I, I am the door. It's me and no one else. I am the door, not the Pharisees who are reviling you, who are insulting you, who are trashing you, who are kicking you out. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. As he was, has already done earlier in his ministry, Jesus makes an exclusive claim to be the means of salvation. The only means of salvation, only through him, can access be made into the safety and security and blessing of God's sheepfold. There is no other way. Now, I grew up when I was young, I I grew up on listening to music on these big things about this big, called a long play record. Anybody familiar with those? Now, Now, they tell you, I'm prone to agree, just maybe more sentimentally than than logically, but I'm told the finest music is listened to and heard not on CDs, or, but on long play vinyl records. And I, I enjoyed that and uh, look back on those days. And th- there's one problem, though, with long play vinyl records. They could be scratched, you know? And if you got a scratch on one, what would happen? The, the, the needle would go so far into the song, and then if it was a deep enough scratch, it would just keep repeating the same thing over and over and over and over again until you got frustrated and took that record off or moved the needle a little bit and kept it going on its merry way. Th- that's where the phrase comes from. He sounds or she sounds like a broken record. They keep keep saying the same thing over and over and over again. I tell you what, if you read the Gospel of John from beginning to end, you begin to understand that John and Jesus are sounding like a broken record because they keep saying the same thing over and over again in different ways, but they say the same thing. And all the book of John is meant for this very purpose. I have written these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have what? Life in his name. And so the whole book of John is written so that we can understand that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one comes into the fold except through Jesus. 
And so we read things in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. In John chapter 5, verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. John chapter 6, verses 47 and 48. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Over and over, Jesus made these exclusive claims to be the only way into the presence of the Father, the only way to be saved. It wasn't the teachings of the Pharisees. It wasn't the teachings of socialism or hedonism or materialism. It's Christ and Christ alone. To many, and perhaps to most of the people in Jesus' day, Jesus' repetitious claims to be mankind's hope of salvation were perhaps as irritating as repetition and chilling sounds which emanate from a broken record. For most, but not for all. In Jerusalem that day, there was a man who experienced the hand of God on his life. And Jesus claimed to be the door to salvation did not grate upon him, but they were music to his ears. And he believed in Jesus. And passing through the door, that door, passing through Jesus, the formerly blind man could see clearly. And he turned his eyes upon Jesus. He looked full in his wonderful face. And that day he was saved and he passed from a scarcity of life to a life of abundant blessing, which is found in Jesus alone. In Jerusalem that day, there was a man whose life was changed. His vision, his physical sight was restored. And through his interactions with Jesus, he was able to see the glory of Christ, which so many others had managed to miss. That day, the formerly blind man became a disciple of Jesus. Now, now the man's story ends here in John's Gospel. Nothing more is heard about him or from him. I suspect that being reviled and rejected by the Pharisees worked its way into his other relationships. I, I suppose that For him, following Jesus likely proved to be a pretty difficult path to navigate. Having been cast out of the synagogue, out of the social network of the day, life probably didn't get much easier in a lot of ways for him. I hope that as he journeyed with Jesus, as one of Jesus' disciples nonetheless, that the words he heard Jesus speak that day proved to be a source of encouragement to him. I, I hope for that formerly blind man who is now a follower of Jesus Christ, I hope that when things got really tough for him, Jesus' words rang with clarity within both his, his head and within his heart. I hope you remember Jesus saying things like, Look, young man, I know your name and I know your needs. I am even now out in front guiding you on this path and protecting you from all harm. And young man, take courage. Your trust in me has gained for you salvation and all of its abundant and attendant blessings. I hope that these words ring true in this man's life. I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. May that be the confidence of every follower of Jesus here this morning. In coming to Christ, nothing of value is ever lost, but things of true value are gained for eternity. As one has said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Life with Jesus is always more. It is never less. And that is why Jesus came to earth. And that is why we celebrate his coming during this Christmas season. Because he came that we might have life. 
and have it to the full. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this record of events that reminds us of the power of Jesus, of the glory of Jesus, that reminds us of the heart of Jesus, who cared for this young man, reviled by most, but loved by the shepherd. Father, thank you that that day, though, his life perhaps got even more difficult because he was your follower. He, thank you that he followed you and that you proved throughout his life to be the good shepherd. Who knew him, who led him, and through faith saved him. Father, we rejoice. Father, I pray for each one here. Father, may we never in difficulties, turn our eyes away from Jesus. But Father, may we always turn our eyes to Jesus. Trusting in Him. Experiencing from Him. Life, both abundant and free. To the glory of the Father. And to the glory of Christ Jesus. And for the blessing of all who follow Him. Father, this is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The song says, I think Jesus could have told it to this young man. I think maybe, and I trust this young man was able to sing it in fullness of heart and throat throughout his life. All the way, my Savior leads me. (laughs) That is where abundance is found. All the way, my Savior leads, leads me. What have I to ask? Beside that, what more can a child of God, a follower of Jesus, desire and long for and need than for Jesus to lead us every step of the journey? Would you stand as we sing those familiar words together as we close? And the, the hymn number 460 in your blue hymnal. We'll sing all three verses. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt His tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? And praise divinest comfort, here by faith with Him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread. Gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, and my soul a thirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. Gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of His love. Perfect rest for me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit, clothed in mortal, wings its flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. Why did Jesus come? 
He came that we might have life and have it to the full. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace. God's blessing upon you.